And the next talk is uh, usage, future-centric story mapping for the quarter prioritization and planning. And with me, uh, here we have uh, Mikel and Roman. Hello, everybody. All yours. Thank you. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Thanks for attending this presentation. Uh, today, we will talk about usage-centric story mapping for quarter prioritization and planning. <clears throat> I'm happy to introduce you, Mikel. Mikel is an agile coach in Adevinta, and we are working together in the same team. Uh, he's passionate about tech and is the father of two kids. And when some spare time remaining to him, he also likes sports and photography. Okay, thank you, Romain, for presenting. I want to introduce Romain. Okay, he's uh, very passionate about team dynamics and organizations, and he joined our, our team of agile coaches recently in Adevinta. And aside from work, well, uh, as you can see in the picture, he's owned by Swiffer, that is his cat. Okay. And I hope that you are not very tired. So we are one of the last, uh, <laughs> we see the Swiffer here. We are one of the last speakers today. And I hope we can make you enjoy this time and go through all this presentation. So what we will see today, OK, will be the benefits of being user-centric from the very beginning, when first describing user stories, that a part that will take Roman, and secondly, by prioritizing and planning uh, the work ahead okay, that I will take. So, Roman, uh, the floor is yours. So, take the mic and let's just start. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you. <clears throat> what do we understand as user centric? As many of you know, every day the market demands for more specific, specific products, very adapted to each other's needs uh, and the, the customer preference. To be user centric, mean that you're able to empathize with your customers to understand their needs, uh, to be able to solve their problem, and to continuously understand uh, the, the change. So being user-centric is not a trend, it's not a good practice, but it's a fundamental way of developing product if you want to stay alive in the market and keep your customers subscribing to your product or service. What is needed to start building a product? What is the recipe? The first step is to identify your customer. Who will benefit from the product? This is also what we call persona. Second, it's important to identify your product strengths. How will your product help the customers? Then you can identify your team capabilities uh, basically, this is how what uh, can your your team do to make the the product uh, possible. You can define the the goals of your product. Then you can implement the priorities, the next the next things to do, and with this you can populate your product backlog by creating the releases, the sprints, and the user story. When does each step happen? So the first thing is to check on the market so that uh, you can identify your customer. And because you know your customers, you can also identify their problems and then you know your product strengths. The next step is that um, <clears throat> you can define your product goal because you know the strengths and the market. With these inputs, you can know more, you can know go into more details, and Mikael will present it to you later. And the details is given your team capabilities, you can set the priorities, and once you do it, uh, let's say the the fact of populating your product backlog, it's it, it's much more easier. Here, I will present three different uh, observations uh, that can be a way to spot the symptoms of not being user-centric. The first one will be user stories. The second one will be about sprint review. And the last one will be about product backlog. 
This is an example of a theoretical user story uh, that is not great for some reason. So as a user, I want to something technical so that as a user, this is something really vague. And once you identify your customers, it's easy to have clearer persona. The action you want to you want to perform uh, is not supposed to be that technical. It's supposed to be understandable for, let's say, almost everyone. And the so that, this is the purpose. And in the case there is no so that, the purpose of why doing the action is missing. What can be, let's say, uh, a better alternative? In our case today, a good user story, I mean, a better one can be as an Advinta Agile conference attendee, I want to discover story mapping for prioritization so that uh, my next work brings more value to marketplaces and end users. Here we will see four real examples of user stories that are existing somewhere in the product backlog in Advinta. Uh, and we will think together on what we can do uh, to make it better. So the first user story is called fuzziness. As a user, I don't want to have fuzziness enabled for four digit dates. Do you think this user story is great or not, given what we see on the previous slide? In fact, this, this user story don't answer the, let's say, the, the so that. We have something to do at least something to not do, but we don't know the purpose. We don't know the why. The next user story is sort by. As a user, I want to be able to sort results by date or price as well as relevant. This user story, in fact, is a concatenation of three different stories and need to be sliced. So you can have a user story uh, about the price sorting, about the date sorting and about the relevant sorting. <clears throat> a third example is tagging. As a team member, I want to monitor the performance of the marketplace and detect any potential quantitative issues with tagging. In this case, again, the purpose is missing. We do something, but we don't know why. The last user story example uh, is called test. As a team member, I want to test in production the first version and the first MVP of SmartIcon in a vertical. For this user story, in fact, it's more like a subtask. We have, let's say, one easy things to do. I don't mean that testing in production is easy, but this is not a user story. It don't, it don't really brings value to a user in this term. And now we move to the second um, observation we can make. And this is about the sprint review. Do you already present a sprint review in front of this audience? This IOD audience represents the stakeholder seats. For many teams today, it's an usual situation. Stakeholder might not be identified or not invited, and sometimes they're just not available. But as the purpose of the sprint review is to collect feedback on the potential shippable increment with no stakeholders, what is the purpose of the sprint review? Here we move to the next, to the last uh, observation about the product backlog. And we will see two different, uh, let's say, um, status of product backlog. The first one is the empty product backlog. Uh, a product backlog might be considered as empty when it contains less than one, one week of work to do for the team. And the opposite is a kind of a messy product backlog when it contains more than 20 weeks of work to do for the team. Given the different observation, what might end up happening? 
So the lack of being user-centric user can lead to uh, the lack of sense, the, de the demotivation of the team. You can observe some churn in the team, some complaint about the purpose. It can also lead to having a product that uh, not evolve or evolve randomly. And finally, you can see that sometimes defining priorities is difficult or unclear. Now, Mikkel will focus on uh, a, a, a scenario where the team have difficulty pr to prioritize and will also consider having a very crowded backlog. So how can Mikkel prioritize and plan being user-centric in this scenario? OK, thank you, Ramen. Indeed, I, I take it from here. So I picked up uh, one of the scenarios that uh, Ramen was presenting, that it was having a messy backlog, and what of the consequences that is being difficult to prioritize. Okay, And actually, it's something that we experienced in one of the teams in Adevinta, and here we will share our experience. Okay, So have you ever felt like this man at the picture? That Have you ever seen a product owner uh, facing a messy backlog? and don't know how to prioritize this because uh, request comes from everywhere. And how can we even prioritize and plan uh, being user-centric? No? So keeping what uh, was Roman proposing as having the user in the, in the center. OK, so we will discover this. But first, we will take a little bit a look on the prioritization history and how prioritization has been done before, before the, the technique we want to propose and keep user-centering in the center. OK? So Are let's you sharing your screen. Yes, I do. I'm not sure it's visible. Ah, you don't see my screen. No, it's probably better. No, no it's okay. better. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, better. Nice. Okay, actually, yeah, I had this. Okay, what I was sharing was this one. Cool. Let's move on to a little history of prioritization. Okay, hypos. Hypos has more than five hundred thousand years of history. And they appear to be that like the first uh, ancient technique of prioritization, and probably you will understand why. And it's because it's called the highest paid person's opinion. Have you ever seen or recognized this person in your meetings when prioritizing? And yes, okay, as you can guess, this is not agile, okay, but I think it's worth mentioning that sometimes we can face these these scenarios also. Then. Uh, after this, these years of evolution, okay, we started gathering and building tribes, and now uh, we need to we have the need of prioritizing based more on teams, okay. So we built many mean many techniques of teams prioritization, and I will present some of them. Okay, one of them can be uh, Moscow, that stands for must have, should have, could have, and won't have, okay, and you can. Pick up your user stories and put it in each of the each of the tabs that we said. Then we have uh, poker voting, where the team assigns some votes to each of the stories and they said we each other ones that they think are more relevant. Then we have cumulative voting, that it's quite similar to poker voting, but the team members are, have a, an amount of points or money, if you are uh, fictional money, that they can spend on user stories and the the ones more voted are the ones promoted in the prioritization. And there is also another classic way of uh, having the squadrons of important or urgent things. And you can uh, spot where your user stories are in those squadrons and decide what to prioritize. OK. OK. And this, and finally, so this is the after this tribe evolution that we created markets okay, in society. And with markets uh, came customers and stakeholders. And sometimes they are the ones that they want to prioritize. Uh, are your customers prioritizing your backlog? Have you faced uh, a stakeholder that prioritizes all your backlog? Do they want all the features at the same time? Uh, right, they are usually very demanding and wants to have the features in the basket. Okay, so right to this point, I think it's good to remember uh, Henry's first quote, telling that if I had asked people what they wanted they would have said faster horses. Okay, So sometimes, probably, your stakeholder is not the best advisor for prioritizing your backlog either. No? So just another opinion. OK, and, and this uh, finalizes the little bit of recap on history of prioritization. 
And let's take a look at what can we do. How can we measure the value of our user stories? And here it's our proposal, OK? So let's be hands on now. What we did, so we defined three factors. First factor is what can we do? So what the team can do? Which are the teams that we know how to do? Which are the ones that we need to learn? And which are the ones that we need to discover? Okay. Depending on the technical knowledge of the team, we can deliver much more value and much more efficient and faster, so much more faster and efficiently. Okay, taking advantage of the strength that Roman was mentioning at the beginning of the of the presentation. Then secondly, the second factor is what will customer buy? Okay, very important. So is something that the customer currently needs? Is something that uh, she's interested in? Or is something that she has thought about it may be attractive or not? So this item considers how good it will be the product fit in the market. And the third one, and finally, the final factor is uh, how passionate is our team about the feature, OK? Does the team love this feature? Does the find it interesting? Or it's just something that we find indifferent, OK? And this factor can make the difference when building innovative things and when we want to get competitive advantage from the competence, OK? So a passionate team can build really very good solutions, innovative, and out of the box. And you are right, OK? So all these factors has overlapping areas, OK? And what we are aiming for is for the overlapping area that we have the higher scores. And this area, what is pointing us is the low hanging fruits of our product, where we can make the bigger impact with the most efficient effort. Okay. So as a summary, okay. So how to measure the value of a user story? So we will evaluate with uh, three points in the technology knowledge factor, three points for something that we know, two points for something that we need to learn, and one point for something that uh, we need to guess or discover or investigate. Okay, same uh, same thing for the customer needs factor, with uh, something that is needed, it's scoring the higher, and th th something that is doubtful, scoring the lower. And the last factor is the team passion, and again, so we score higher the th something that the team loves to do, and we score lower something that the team feels more indifferent. And once we have all the scores, we multiply them and get a final value of our user story value. Cool. Then up until now, we have what is the user story value. Then now we need to prioritize. So how can we prioritize all this? Okay. So and we will prioritize and go from a flat backlog that probably if you are working in, in Scrum, you are used to, to a story mapping. Okay, then how can we do this easily with three steps? So first, as I told you, we will score the three factors and get the user story value. Then secondly, what we will put is to the higher scorings in the first versions. And probably what we will define is version one and version two of our story mapping. Okay, as you can see here, I put an example of uh, the higher points of the R27. If we pick up the, the points that we defined it previously. And the second one will be 18, OK? And then go, going down. And as, as a third step, as we are taking care only of individual user stories, we have a third step of checking that the version has a meaning as a customer, OK, and adjusting. So if we see that some stories doesn't take sense, even if it's a very high scoring, doesn't take sense as a product delivery in the first version, we can move it to the second one, OK? And looking at the version as a whole. OK, and this way we can also identify dependencies and we define what the user can do in that version. Cool. So this is the full picture. Then finally, OK, we talk about how be user centric in our in our user stories, in our ceremonies. How can we calculate the user story value and how to prioritize by that? OK. So what can we do next? What, our, what can be our takeaways from this talk? Okay, And here, Roman and me, we gathered these three questions that we, you can go through and probably can help you on being more user-centric from now on. Okay, First of all, how do you define your product to be user-centric and related on all the topics that Roman was mentioning? Okay, On writing down the user stories, how you describe them, and if you follow Roman's recommendation. Then the second. Uh, takeaway probably can be how do you measure the value delivered to your users? Okay? 
and it's very tricky part it's true but at least today we have a we have a proposal that you can pick up from this talk okay and the, the last one is what can you change in your team to prioritize by value okay so in your planning meetings do you consider that value that user story value as a rational to prioritize your stories and in our side, that's all. So you can you can put all your questions in the in the chat box, and we will try to answer them. And if not, we, you you can contact us in a Slack channel. So I hope these questions help you go through being more user centric in your team. And the mic is yours now. If you have questions, if you have uh, feedback to share with us about the, the presentation, feel free. Yeah, indeed. Meanwhile, if if you are uh, writing some questions, uh, I share with you the code that we have in the conference, so you can provide us a feedback and and help us on improving this conference. That we are in our first version, and we are eager to improve. Looks like that uh, there are no questions yet. So remember that we have uh, around 20 seconds of delay between the, the mm -hmm. presentation and the stream. So let's wait a little bit. Well, we can accept also questions about cat food and <laughs> the things that we have uh, Roman as an expert. <laughs> Sion Leroux really liked the user story example. Thank you, Sion. Thanks, that's feedback. In fact, we wanted to start this uh, presentation with kind of concrete example that we can observe in your day-to-day -day life so, so that you can easily spot even if you don't have let's say a agile coach scrum master or experienced facilitator some situation when you can see maybe we can improve our way of being user centric I have one question. How many times have you read the, the, the user story mapping book from Jeff Patton? <laughs> Not that many. <laughs> Not that many, indeed. It is a, it is a really insightful book. It, it, uh, he just, I yeah, really, yeah we, we did the exercise with the story mapping, but you can do it without. So it's a matter of being more user centric and, and adding. An extra layer of, of value but you can do for example the of course all the things that we presented here we, you can do it without user story mapping okay so uh, romance recommendations can be followed by without story mapping and the uh, value of the user stories you can apply it in a flat backlog also okay i'm curious by that or, or at least take that in consideration not only not only that point of view but exactly. indeed the thing is that yeah, we did it with story mapping because it allowed us to have a more wider picture of what <laughs> will be the product increments. That's cool. Well, as, as you know, no we interactions over processes and tools, but tools are there to to help those interactions. Mm -hmm. Totally. So if there's no more questions, uh, Let's let's uh, let's wait five five minutes until the next speaker. But let's conclude this talk. Thank you, guys. Thank uh, you. Thank you. See you later.